shattering mist. Uh, Nick, before uh, we uh, continue to talk about the possibility of, uh, of reincarnation, I want to go back to your uh, original premise, where I concur that uh, God did not tell us everything, um, mainly because there's many things that uh, would be beyond our understanding. Uh, but here's what I also know, that everything he did tell us is true, and that he did prove that he was God in his revelation, and that he told us everything that we needed to know to make a decision in this life whether or not we wish to engage in a relationship with him or not. And under that understanding, Nick, if uh, reincarnation, if we had second and third uh, uh, opportunities to make the right decision, and so that that depending on how many lives we were uh, given, we had either uh, um, uh, several or a score or hundreds of opportunities to get it right, and all we had to do is one time get it right, and, and if the next time we came back and we got it wrong, or we would never come back if we ever got it right, that kind of information would be essential. And God doesn't give us that information. He doesn't say anything that remotely would infer that that is the case. And so since I know for certain that what he said can be relied upon and that he told us what we need to know to make a decision if we want to be part of his covenant family, I think I would rely on that rather than the rather remote possibility that uh, reincarnation is true. Now, one last thought, uh, Nick, and then I've got uh, Kirk on the, the line here, and um, that is that that I, uh, during the, the break, I had seven or eight minutes to, uh, to read, and I read a number of, of, uh, of in-depth articles by uh, those uh, claiming to take a scientific investigation towards these uh, stories, the kind of stories that you've uh, mentioned. And most of them are reports that take place in, uh, in Turkey, uh, of all places. Uh, and uh, there, there's been a number of cases where uh, a, a child in a, uh, a community um, reports that uh, that they have some knowledge of the uh, of the circumstances surrounding a, a dead person. And uh, I read through the um, um, much of, uh, of some of these articles uh, as much as time as I could uh, in the break, and. Uh, Boy, I tell you what, I, it looks awfully lean to me. I'd be really careful about uh, basing my uh, the future of my soul on uh, the possibility that uh, that these are um, are valid. Well, thank you for taking your time to speak yep. with me. And I've been, by the way, Nick. You are always welcome on this program, and uh, we will always devote uh, time to uh, to your questions. They are always thoughtful, and uh, I have grown to appreciate you. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. Bye. With that, uh, we have uh, another uh, um, favorite uh, caller, um, a, a good friend, a member of the Covenant family, uh, Kirk, who has uh, called in from uh, California. Where are you in the the great uh, Golden State of California? Up in, uh, up in Northern California in Folsom. Oh, okay. I lived 35 years in Orange County, and we kind of semi-retired. I thought I was retiring until Obamacare hit me, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm still working. Uh, yeah. bit, but I don't have to work quite so hard as I went ahead uh, on this. Uh, okay, so you're up at Folsom, huh? Yes, sir. Okay, yeah, it's one of my uh, my uh, yeah one of my favorite uh, albums. Of course, was recorded at Folsom uh, Prison. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I was, uh, I'm sure you've seen the movie Walk the Line, and and uh, yeah, know of the uh, of the history. And <laughs> you don't all have that same dirty water now up there in Folsom, do you? No, no, it's, it is it is really gorgeous up here. We've had that little drought, but it's not. Uh, it's been raining, so we, everything's getting full again. So I, I'm an artist, so I came up here ready to paint in my in my old age. So uh, oh, I didn't know you were you were an artist. Uh, oh, yeah, what, that's what I do what, for a living. Oh, really? What what right. kind of uh, of art do you uh, you create well, for the most? Well, I started out as a magazine and book illustrator and uh, oh, okay. painter, and then when I came out to California. I, I wind up owning my own art school and gallery and all that sort of thing, and sold a lot of stuff in Laguna and things like that. So, I've got to tell you, uh, Kirk, and you may not know this, but I am there. There are 
there are three groups of people that I am uh, I'm uh, shamelessly envious of. I'm shamelessly envious of uh, of people who have uh, have great athletic skill. I mean, I would love to have been able to make a living playing golf, for example, or baseball. I or, tried. You know, I, I tried to in high school, and I was always good enough to make the varsity team, but never good enough to be a star on that team, much less to go on. Uh, and so I tried to, but I just it wasn't in the cards for me. Uh, and then the second is that uh, I dearly love to sing, but I can't carry a tune in a bucket. And so I'm envious of those people who can really sing because I think it would be a, uh, I think it'd just be a wonderful thing to do, uh, be able to do. And the third is that, uh, um, you know, I've spent most of my life in, in marketing where conveying ideas visually is an, is important. And I've always been reliant on those who had the skill to do so. I can envision it in my mind. I can communicate to the artist what I want to see. But uh, I have no capability whatsoever <laughs> of drawing it myself. It, it may be why I like the Palo Hebrew because yes. of the visual, you know, and, and the uh, the symbols and all that uh, is intriguing to me more so than just uh, uh, any regular alphabet. I mean, that's yeah. pretty, pretty impressive stuff. Yeah, for all of our uh, our listeners and men most probably know this, but the original language uh, of Hebrew, uh, the original alphabet, in fact, man's first actual alphabet, uh, was a pictorial alphabet. Uh, alphabet where the uh, letters not only conveyed a sound but they also uh, conveyed imagery and and the interesting thing is that if you want to know the meaning of a Hebrew word you really don't have to look it up in a uh, in a Hebrew dictionary you just can look at the original letters and and Kirk is correct they are they are all designed to convey what uh, what Yahweh had in mind uh, you know you just look at the at the uh, first um, letter it's uh, the first word in Hebrew. Okay. It's uh, it's based upon the first two letters in the Hebrew alphabet, uh, Aleph and Beth, uh, and it's Ab. It's the Hebrew word for father. And it's interesting that in the language God created, the very first word is uh, is how he most wants to be known, father. And that's telling by itself. But you look at the uh, the visual depiction of that most important uh, title, father. And you find that the first is a, a picture of a ram's head. And the ram's head was uh, designed to show capability. You know, it was the, uh, the, the ram was this, is, is always viewed as this enormously capable uh, in the, uh, animal that was, and that was through the, uh, the, uh, the ram that, that whatever needed to be done to protect um, a, um, uh, a herd or flock uh, w- could be done. Uh, the ram was a leader, uh, and the uh, the ram was was uh, f- uh, fully capable. And then the uh, the second letter is uh, Bayeth, which was drawn in the form of a of a home, a protective enclosure for a family uh, with a uh, with a single entrance or doorway. And you put those two things together, and you have the uh, uh, the Hebrew word father. And then you you add uh, L, which is the word for Almighty, and you add uh, to uh, the uh, the power and capability, the leadership capacity of Aleph. This time you add uh, Lamed, which was drawn as a shepherd's staff, and the shepherd's staff was designed to uh, to convey that the the one who would uh, lead us, the one who would protect us, the one who would nourish us, the one who would guide us. Um, and so, you know, with with every word in Hebrew, mm-hmm. uh, the the word itself is defined by those so we, uh, graphic illustrations. We have the little charts, and then you can literally go down uh, with every letter and write every possible meaning for that letter, and then you just take a word and you do all that, and you get a deeper understanding of the word just uh, just by breaking it all down for letter for letter for. Yes, uh, maybe you're even talking about the charts that uh, are prepared for um, uh, the introduction to God. It's in the yeah. I have the that works. one, and I have I have a couple more. So it's uh, yeah. so everything, and then you look in your dictionaries and all. You can just keep on going, and, and it's like wow. You know? Yeah, one of my favorite is uh, is Bayeth. You know, uh, Bayeth and Bayreth are are two of the most telling words in uh, Hebrew. One is family, and the other one is family-oriented relationship. Uh, Bereth is the uh, Hebrew word for covenant. 
and uh, you know you look at the letters that comprise it, and you, you can understand what it's all about. I mean, it begins with a word and the letter that means family that depicts home. You know, that the graphic depiction of a uh, of a family home, uh, and then uh, the, uh, the the next letter is the Hebrew yod, which is God's hand. Uh, reaching down and out to us, the open hand to, to you know, to just as a father does uh, to the children in his home, to guide them, to lift them up, to uh, to hold them, um, to cherish them, uh, to nurture them, to feed them, and you know, all of the to lead them, all the things that that an open hand uh, from a father uh, does, and and then in uh, and bereth, the Hebrew word for covenant, the rosh is the next letter. And, you know, here you, you have this particular family identified. It's the first family. Uh, it's the, the most important family. And also, uh, and, and even the last letter, the death, the, you have God's signature on it, his mark, his affirmation that everything, uh, about this, all the promises he has made regarding the covenant family come from him and are therefore reliable. Uh, this is more fun. I wanted to address though a couple things on okay. that Nick had said, just because uh, uh, it might be interesting. Okay. Uh, uh, they, they did a lot of studies on. I don't read a lot of that stuff, but once upon a time, I'd run across some things where uh, someone would claim all their past lives, and then they'd put them mm-hmm. into hypnosis, and they would find that uh, there were books that they had read or things that they came out. Uh, that they had memorized or whatever, knowingly or unknowingly, and they were telling the story that somebody had recognized in a book. Right. Uh, and then there was, um, it was presented to me one time that uh, we know that uh, people can be demon-possessed and demons Correct. that uh, live uh, eternally. Right. Uh, they're going to be in a closed-in space once, but they live eternally. So if they had right. possessed someone before, they knew right. about their lives, and if they possess someone now, Right. They would know about those lives as well, so they, their information would sound rather incredible. Right. It wouldn't necessarily be the person. Yes. As a matter of fact, Kirk, if you can stay with us, uh, I, in the articles uh, that I read during the the last break, there's a third example as to uh, how this information is passed on, and I'd like to share it um, in terms of people uh, almost always growing up in proximity to the uh, deceased individual and the information that families just naturally pass on that is absorbed by uh, other members of the family. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back to Shattering Miss. We uh, have uh, Kirk on the line. and uh, We are now uh, discussing the uh some of the explanations that uh that create the very thin uh support uh, for reincarnation um, and the really i think kirk you've done enough uh research into this and what little i've done uh, also confirms that really the only the only support there is for reincarnation is these uh, very infrequent and rare incidences, usually in uh, third world countries, and today mostly uh, in uh, uh, either India or Islamic countries, whereby a, uh, uh, a young person um, will claim to have knowledge of a deceased person's life. And as you say, uh, when the, when there has actually been a scientific investigation of their claims, like uh, they are put under hypnosis hypnosis where they have less control over um, over sourcing, they'll admit that uh, well I read a book on it. Uh, that's how I came to know. Uh, the the other uh, means um, is uh, of course in, in demon possession, of course, and particularly in the Islamic world would be rife, but the the other means is that we our lives leave an imprint. Um, there are there's so much that can be known about us, particularly when we uh, we uh, live in in fairly primitive uh, communities. The more primitive the community, kind of the more 
people are likely to know um, a little bit about the community's past and uh, and the people who live there because there really isn't there's not so much clutter you know and in the world of uh, of Folsom it might be a beautiful place but there's there's still a lot of clutter a lot of distractions but in the countries where these things occur typically they're fairly primitive not a lot of clutter and it would be natural for uh, for those growing up in those communities to know a little bit about uh, their uh, their ancestors and about what the community was like uh, previously, because it's just part of the fabric of uh, of those uh, areas. And and uh, the reports that I have read that's that is the primary means of uh, of these young people making um, such claims and having such knowledge. It's just what is known communally. Well, you know, there's, there's one other thing I was going to uh, mention just for, okay. uh, perhaps for Nick. Uh, my great aunt used to write all that stuff down from, uh, Edgar Casey used to when he'd go into a trance. Mm-hmm. And, and even though he did some remarkable things, you know, approaching miraculous, uh, you know, as far as health to helping people with their health problems, mm-hmm. when you really study your stuff, this is a demon possessed guy. So if you, uh, you know what happens sometimes? Somebody does something wonderful, and then everything they say becomes uh, uh, overly popular, or, or, or they believe mm-hmm. to be the truth. So mm-hmm. they give a lot more credibility to that than they would normally had he not done all the things that he did. So when you yeah. run across things like that, you got to be, in my opinion, you got to be yeah. real careful not to give them more credibility than they have just because. Yeah. In fact, you know, this we, is, think God, we think doctors are God sometimes, you know, and that yeah. sort of thing. So, yeah, yeah, one yeah. of the things, too, is that, you know, you read uh, Yahusha's commentary at the end of his Sermon on the Mount, where he is he has talked about uh, the influence that the wolf in sheep's clothing is going to have on uh, Christians. He's speaking, of course, of, uh, of Paul. And uh, he's uh, uh, telling them that those who call him Lord, that don't know his, his uh, name, or that don't know Yahweh's name, are going to be excluded from heaven. And then the, you know, these uh, Christians, they come back and they protest, uh, and they not listening because they'd never listened to him, you know, call him Lord, Lord again. Uh, just after he told them, no one calling me Lord is going to enter heaven. Yeah, the door is closed. If, you're, if you refer to me Lord, the door to heaven is closed. But they, you know, they're not listening to him, so they say Lord, Lord again. And they say, you know, haven't we done these mighty miracles in your name? Haven't we driven out demons in your name? Haven't, you know, we... Uh, we uh, um, uh, establish great uh, proclamations in your name. And he says, no, I don't know you. Get away from me. Uh, and, and this is the uh, a ploy, I, I think, that that many deceivers have used. First, there's sleight of hand that creates uh, the impression of a miracle. There's sometimes just knowledge that can lead to uh, to... Uh, surpassing people's ordinary understanding. That was used all the time in pagan religions where, you know, they would build a fire inside of a, uh, of a graven image and put a little water in it and, and put a whistle in its nose and, you know, it would scream out at the people and scare them, you know. So, I mean, there's lots of things that, you, you know, gunpowder that would create a flash, you know, and, and scare people. Uh, there's, there's lots of that and there's lots of healing that takes place through uh, science uh, and through uh, diet, through medicine, through, in fact, even the right kind of attitude can make a tremendous impact on a person's uh, well-being and their recovery from from disease. Uh, and so there's lots of things that, that people can do to create the impression that they are trustworthy when they're not. More on this when we return in a moment. <laughs> Henry Miss, we're having a conversation with uh, Kirk, and we're talking about um, the, uh, the the basis for uh, reincarnation. And uh, and I, I think, uh, uh, Kirk, your last point, which was that um, that either through uh, uh, demonic uh, inspiration or through just uh, physical knowledge, that you can create what appears to be uh, miracles to deceive people. Uh, I could well be the uh, the few unexplained cases uh, in terms of reincarnation. Uh, you know, I'm I think I'm like you, Kirk, in the realization that uh, we give 
Satan and his uh, demons far too much credit. Um, I think they they do a lot less than they are blamed for having uh, done. But that doesn't change the fact that uh, that there are thousands of them, that they do possess individuals, uh, and that uh, it is in their interest to uh, to make their most effective tools, um, people, therefore, political and religious leaders, seem credible. You know, Paul performed uh, miracles, uh, and yet Paul most certainly had no relationship with Yahweh. He was a he was a, you know overtly opposed to Yahweh, and he uh, Paul actually a- admitted the reason he was able to perform miracles. He said, "I'm demon possessed," and so yeah, I think there is a uh, a fair amount of that, uh, and that's why. There are things that um, that appear miraculous, uh, that are designed to appear miraculous, to give credibility to religious and political and military leaders. And uh, you know, if you're um, moved by them, you know, be careful. And, and many people are. I mean, yes. Show up for the all the services, you know, where we, you know, the healing services and so forth. Oh there. boy, you know, Benny Hinn was oh, the number no, one oh, guy. Yeah. yeah, Benny Hinn. You know, uh, when I was uh, uh, close to Jerry Falwell, we would talk about Benny Hinn because uh, Jerry was uh, not only knew Benny Hinn pretty well, uh, and uh, uh, both of them crossed paths a lot. Uh, Falwell once asked uh, Benny Hinn, uh, said, you know, uh, I admire your uh, your ability to uh, to have dinner and a show and to raise money uh, based upon these uh, these healings because you, you know you're making a fortune. You know, you're driving, he was flying around in a G2 at the time, uh, and uh, so Falwell asked him, Benny, with all of these uh, these events and all of the healings, has there been one single person that you actually think you healed? And Hen said, "No, not one. It's all the show." Isn't that amazing that he would say that? Yeah. Oh, he made it to follow. Oh. Follow wasn't going to out him. Not one. No. Every single one of them was a uh, was a fraud, and he knew it was a fraud. And by the way, every religious leader knows that what they're doing is a fraud. They know that they are uh, are lying. But it doesn't take much to, to fool people. Karen and I talk about that. We say, do, do they really not know or they just believe the lie so strongly that they, they've accepted it? They, they, they have to know. You know, I think there's a difference, uh, Kirk, uh, between religious leaders and the victims of the religious leaders. I think the victims are The fooled. leaders would have to know. I mean, they know. You they know. They know. And I think that's the reason why God is saying that, getting right back to Kirk's, uh, I mean, excuse me, to, uh, to Nick's uh, comments, uh-huh. is that, that uh, it is appropriate for God to hold the leaders who know better and are misleading for their own personal wealth and, uh, and power, to hold them accountable. You know, to send them to the place of eternal separation, where because they know what they're doing is wrong, and so to deal with them that way, which is why every pope is going to be there, every cardinal, every uh, every bishop, every uh, every televangelist, they're all going to be there uh, in hell, the uh, the place of eternal separation, known in, as Sheol. Um, but those that they have deceived, I don't think they know. You know, I think that if you were to take the average Muslim jihadist, uh, they've just been played for a fool. But if you take the imam, I don't think there's a single imam, imam on the planet today that actually believes that the Quran is a as an accurate reflection of God's testimony. I mean, it's impossible to study it and to know what it says and to think it's true. Uh, I'm, I have to run a little bit, but I wanted to thank you. I know you went, when you went off on your uh, vacation, you were kind enough to send me some stuff on Yasha Yah, and I appreciated that. We've been studying that, and that's, boy, that is powerful stuff. Boy, yeah, we're, we're talking about the uh, the, the uh, programs that we've actually been doing, which are based yeah, upon a, uh, a chapter. Uh-huh. Yeah, the chapter that I have not published yet, which is uh, is on Yasha Yah 17 and, uh, and 18. I'm, uh, in fact, I spent uh, two hours this morning uh, continuing to add to uh, that particular uh, chapter, uh, and I did send it to you before I left. The, uh, for our listeners, and in, in the last segment of this program, I'm going to return to, uh, to that text, and we're going to continue to cover it. And the reason it is so powerful 
is it is prophecy that is literally happening in our midst, and the prophecies are so unbelievably detailed and so all-encompassing about what's going to happen here in these uh, last days that it's uh, it's riveting to your soul. I mean, it's one of those things which said, if if you've already come to know Yahweh and you are absolutely convinced that uh, he is God and that we, you can trust what he relied, it's, uh, it's, it's riveting in that, wow, he, he told us really everything we need to know. And, uh, Not taking your tracks, I mean. You know, yeah, wow. and, and if you were of those that were still trying to make a decision, is, is this Torah and prophet uh, God real? Is, uh, is, can I trust what he had to say? There is really no way to listen to his testimony on how the Syrian war is going to uh, 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 eviscerate uh, Israel uh, and lead to a, a regional war that turns into a global war uh, and, um, and walk away and say, well, this was committed to writing uh, 2,700 years ago at a time when Israel didn't even exist. Uh, there is just no way that that that, that this was you can't, revealed you by can't, chance. You can't hide this. No, it's right there. No. Yeah, you can't uh, hide this. I, I must run. We appreciate you. We'll see you this evening, and uh, uh, so uh, look forward to talking, seeing you tonight. Okay. Okay. Then, what, you uh, thank you, Kurt. What Kurt yes, is sir. referring to is for uh, for the rest of our listeners. We. On Fridays, we do a second uh, program. It's on uh, Blog Talk Radio, uh, not on uh, GCN. Uh, if you were to Google Yada Yada Radio, it would take you directly uh, to it. But it um, is at 7.30 uh, Eastern Time um, on uh, uh, Blog Talk Radio. I do a program that is devoted entirely to the Torah and prophets. Uh, it has many participants. It has a very active uh, chat room that's part of the, uh, the program. And we spend uh, an hour and a half. Uh, on the uh, the dawn of the Shabbat, uh, Friday as the sun sets, uh, speaking about what God had to tell us. It is a uh, it's a marvelous way to begin each uh, Shabbat, and we will do that again uh, uh, here in a few hours uh, today. All right. So thank you here. Thank you, Kurt. Returning to the uh, the prophecy, uh, Yashaya, we were at Yashaya 17.7, and I want to uh, jump right back in uh, where we uh, left off. Uh, God is saying, in that specific day, this man will, genu- will genuinely regard and always accept the Almighty, his Maker, and his eyes will continuously look towards God, the set-apart one of Yisrael. So what day are we talking about? Now, this prophecy, we're now in the the seventh statement relative to this prophecy. It began with God telling us that Damascus, which is the longest surviving continuously inhabited city on earth, would fall. That it would become a twisted heap of ruins. He told us that the war would destroy Syria. And that the Syrian government would fall. He told us, and this is a prophecy that was not only written 2,700 years ago in 750 BCE, but we have the entirety, the, the oldest extant and complete book from antiquity. It happens to be the book of Isaiah, of Yashaya. Uh, uh, you'll find it, in, it's called the, the, uh, the Dome of the Scroll. And there's a uh, there's an entire building that, that that wraps around this one scroll. It's entirely intact from the first word to the last word, and uh, that particular scroll dates to 250 BCE. And it's talking about events that we are witnessing today that would have been unfathomable even 50 years ago. And so it, after saying that the government of Damascus is going to fall. It it talks about the collateral damage and the annihilation of the the outcasts, the refugees, who are in Lebanon and Jordan. Then it transitions directly to the thinning of Israel, which means that Israel had to be back as a nation and intact as a nation, had to return to very near uh, original borders to be thinned at the waist, which is taking it back to the pre-1967 lines, which makes Israel only five miles wide as its waist, which, as the prophecy said, is unsustainable. 
God then speaks at this point of a harvest, of a gleaning of 7,000 souls being removed prior to the beginning of a vexing time of great tribulation. And he will transition into an all-Islamic assault, a flood of Muslim Mujahideen coming into Israel. But before he gets to the presentation of of that uh, onslaught of jihadists, where a hundred million Muslims or more are going to come into Israel as a tidal wave of violence, of rage. He, as a heavenly father, speaks of removing his children from uh, uh, from the earth prior to this uh, time of, uh, of horrible trouble. And so, here we have God doing exactly what he has uh, promised. And now, in relationship to this harvest, God is telling us that the conditions that are going to exist in um, in heaven are going to be the antithesis of those on earth. We have our good friend Larry, who was kind enough to do uh, several shows while uh, while I was gone on vacation, who has uh, called in, and Larry is also my uh, co-host when we do the Shabbat show on uh, on Friday evening, although he was the host of the show for the last two weeks. Uh, Larry, I hear the music playing, but right after the break, I hope that you, you can join us and we can talk about um, the difference that God is is presenting between heaven and earth at this time. It will the contrast will never be greater between what man will do religiously and militarily and politically to uh, fellow man on earth and what those individuals will experience who enter heaven. <laughs> Shattering Mist, we're considering one of the most important prophecies, I think, in uh, all of the Torah and prophets and uh, in Psalms. And it's a uh, prophecy that uh, I sent you the rewrite of uh, Larry just uh, prior to departing on vacation. Um, and I do very much appreciate the shows you did while I was gone. Oh, that, you're quite welcome. I'm not sure how deep I got into anything, but, uh, you know, hopefully it helps some. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. And, and, and again, it, it's just in the way Zachariah writes about fast flying war machines with drivers in them. Yes. In, in, in the battle of Armageddon. Uh, you know, here we have Yisrael being thinned at the waist. And yeah. of course it didn't exist as a country, you know, 60 years no. ago. No. So it, it, here it, we're it, watching it all right. come together, and you can present this evidence to people. And yes. I have done so and had them say, eh, that does, that's your interpretation. You know, but so what's the main thing? My interpretation. At the time that the prophecy was being uh, uh, written, committed to paper, uh, Israel didn't exist. The only, the only aspect of Israel, uh, I mean, at that time, what, what was called Israel, which was the northern kingdom, was completely gone. But there weren't, the people were gone, the cities were completely destroyed, there was nothing left of Israel at the time that this prophecy was, uh, was, uh, written down. And the only vestige of, uh, of a combined Israel, which would be the, uh, the kingdom of Yehuda, was just, uh, Jerusalem. One city. And, and at the time that this was committed to paper, the, uh, the Babylonians, were on the cusp of uh, of annihilating them, <laughs> and, and they did. And so, I, for better part of uh, of 2,700 years, this prophecy was impossible. There was no Israel to dissect at the waste. Yeah, it's only and, possible in this last generation when he said he would bring all of his people back to the land. And, yeah. and this is this is the deal. This, this is, is what deal. we're seeing. It's it, we're watching. Prophecy unfold in front of our eyes, and there are people that are just oblivious to it because you know, they want to be. You know, Larry, the other thing that's interesting here, too, and I didn't really catch it until this last time uh, through, is that that uh, Syria didn't exist as a uh, as a country until quite recently. Because Syria, the uh, in fact, the, the Hebrew term for Syria uh, is really refers to Assyria, and Assyria 
uh, was destroyed at the time that this was being committed to paper. Uh, at the time, the Babylon, the Babylonians were uh, were pursuing the uh, the Assyrians, and they destroyed the Assyrians. They they prevailed over them, and so. Assyria, which is the Syria we're talking about where he says the government falls, uh, it couldn't fall in the future because it had already fallen and it wouldn't exist again. There wouldn't be a rebirth of, uh, of Syria, greater Syria, until the aftermath of World War I. You know, a uh, hundred years ago is when it even became possible for the Syrian government to fall because there was no Syrian government. I mean, just so every aspect of this, and then you even get to the details about uh, the uh, the nature of the nation across the sea, directly opposed to uh, to Israel, uh, the opposite side of the world from Israel, and all of the all of the uh, specifics that are labeled against them. But but even in the uh, in their nature, uh, God refers to birds of prey. To falcons and uh, and eagles and and hawks and you recognize that's what we have named all of our warbirds. I mean, our best fighters are eagles and fal- and falcons. That's what we have the most of. And the the next on onto them are raptors. <laughs> and then we have all of the uh, of the uh, of the seahawks and various uh, a hawk named uh, helicopters. Uh, and the description our, our, our of the hel- helicopters. Whirling and buzzing wings, you know. yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, that that lead this uh, parade of uh, of violence and arrogance uh, of uh, of America and yeah, how they're the giant launched, Navy. yeah, the launched giant from Navy. ships, yeah, uh, unreal, yeah, yeah it is, it is, uh, it is so astonishing. It's so detailed, and uh, the, the bottom line is there is no way to consider what God had to say with an open mind. And not uh, come as Nick did in, uh, in his call up to us early. He says, you know, I've read the Torah. I can't find anything that's untrue in it. I can't find a contradiction in it. Uh, everything that, uh, that God said proves that he is God. Proves that uh, he is right. That he told us the, uh, the truth. And that's what's reaffirmed in all of these prophecies. That's why the prophecies exist. Is to prove that Yahweh exists. And that he can be trusted and relied upon. So, Larry, my good friend, we're, are you going to be able to join me for uh, our Shabbat yeah. show this uh, yeah, this yeah, evening? I'll, I'll, I'll be doing that. Yeah. We'll uh, all join together at that time. May God bless.